we wake Hear the birds and see the sun Side by side our fears are done Oh, the good times just begun back so i can confirm that it is a lot colder out here than the last time i sat out here and filmed and i guess that shows how long it's been because somehow it is now november i have been here for two and a bit months in germany and a lot has changed my perspective has changed my sleep deprivation level has definitely changed we've got tea metaphorical and literal We've got good energy. We've got a beautiful cloudy day for some good, like miserable, but cozy autumn energy. And yeah, I'm literally just gonna sit and chat and catch up with you guys. Yeah, I don't know why this catch up feels oddly special because I guess it's me reflecting on experiences I've had and I hope you enjoy. So I have lived in Berlin for two, nearly three months. There's no big plan to this video, but I would love to discuss the cultural differences I've found, my perspectives on Berlin, the adventure that is living in Germany. Also, I don't know where you are in the world right now. I don't know what COVID is like, but for us, we're back in mini lockdown. It's a strange lockdown situation because a lot of non-essentials are still open, but this home is my office and my chill space and my kitchen, living space, sleep space. Okay, so maybe we'll start with my German. My German is going awfully and that is because Berlin is the most international city where everyone speaks English and there's no assumption that you need to try and speak German. Even when I try, I think they hear my accent and they just revert to English. I am once again experiencing the privilege of having English as my mother tongue because it's just the default language here and it's crazy how people will accommodate my language even though this isn't my country, you know, the language here is German. Technically, I should be trying my absolute hardest to get better at German and try and integrate myself. But people don't want to let me. They don't want to let me try. They just, they just default. I know this isn't the same for a lot of Germany and I know Germans are very proud of their language, which I think is cool. And actually speaking to that, I think something that makes Berlin feel so homey is that there are so many internationals here. This is a city where it's really hard to define a Berliner because Berlin is made of everyone. <laughs> I live in Kreuzberg, which is a luxury. I love this area. It is. It has a lot of Turkish influence. There was a lot of Turkish migration to Berlin. That means we just have amazing falafel places really cheaply everywhere near me, which is so cool. You'll just be walking down the river Spree and you'll hear Spanish and then you'll hear English and then you'll hear German and then you'll hear Dutch and then I'll just be partying because I'm so happy to hear Dutch because it's my mum's mother tongue and I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm at home. And maybe within the internationalism, another reason that I feel so at home here is Berlin feels like a weird combination between London and like Amsterdam or bikey Netherlands cities. And German as a language is really similar to Dutch, which means I can just intuitively understand a lot of what people are saying. So yeah, it just feels, easy it just feels homey i love it <laughs> and i'm vegan and this is the capital of veganism i have never been so blessed with a city that understands the values of sustainability and environmentalism and veganism in a really cool way such that every cafe has a vegan option like a good vegan cake that's actually moist and not dry and horrible or you're spoiled with options of vegan alternatives in shops and there's like everywhere stocks oat milk often as the default it just feels like a city that has just taken a lot of aspects of me and has just just put it in a, in a great environment in a great vibe city interesting again because Apparently so many people in Germany make fun of Berlin as being one of the ugliest cities. And I think it depends how you define beauty. The like rough around the edges, graffiti-ness of Berlin is what gives it such a raw beauty. Because this city has gone through hell and back. There is so much rich history to every single street. Like literally down the road from me is where the Berlin Wall used to be. Like literally just right there. People couldn't even stand on my street being this close to the wall without like guards watching them being like, what are you doing? Are you trying to get to the west? Like, what are you doing? Sometimes you see a street and sure you're like, okay, maybe it looks a bit mismatched, maybe a little bit ugly if you didn't read deeper. 
But then you do read deeper, there are like plaques everywhere and you're like, oh my God, like this is where this iconic event in World War II happened. You have these little things called Stolpersteins, Stol Stolperstein, which basically means stumbling stone and they're small plaques and they're in front of the houses of Jewish people who were in the Holocaust, were murdered in World War II and it's like, bam, instantly, just through that little tiny stumbling stone, you are reminded of the crazy events that happen right here where you are standing. All those history lessons I had in the UK about World War II, all the World War II movies I've seen, all the books I've read, all the accounts, all the personal stories I've read. I am walking streets that hold those stories and a city doesn't let you forget it. And I think that's special in a weird way. And then it's also a very politically active city and that's reflected in the graffiti and the art and the radicalism. And I think there's a beauty in that too. As a new person in the city, I love trying to understand some of the issues that the city faces. And one of them, as in most major cities, is gentrification. If you don't know what gentrification is, it's basically where they take an area which might seem a bit run down and make it more beautiful and build new houses and new apartments and try and attract wealthier people into the area who buy these houses. And there are areas in Berlin like Prenzlauerberg, which is a gorgeous area with lovely cafes and kind of more pricey restaurants, but really beautiful where it's like a residential area, a lot of wealthier white people live there, which on the surface seems great, seems cool, beautiful area to visit. But one of the main issues of gentrification is in driving up these house prices, which a lot of international people can come in and pay, you are almost intentionally driving out lower income people who can't afford these new rent prices. We have a lot of squatting communities here. There are anarchist rallies. There are a lot of people who are against the system here. There's a lot of police involvement. There's a lot of graffiti talking about gentrification and the effects it's having on people. One of my favorite places in the city is an abandoned airport called Tempelhoffveld. Now a massive field with the best vibes where people do roller skating and it's, and it's fun and it's a massive open green space and I love it. But one of the discussions in the city is we have a centrally located massive space where we could put housing to help accommodate so many people in the city who are having to leave because of these increasing house prices. Like, should we build apartments here or should we keep it as this beautiful natural open space, which Berlin is also associated with? There's a lot of discussions like that. And to my knowledge this year, they froze rent prices, I think for like five years or something like that, which is hopefully meant to help stop landlords driving people out. So that's positive. Yeah, and it's really interesting thinking about gentrification when the wall fell and how areas like Kreuzberg, where I now live, this was a poorer area, this was right by the wall, but then when the wall fell, bam, all of a sudden we're very centrally located in the city and this area has been hugely gentrified. All the things that benefit me and make it fun to live here, but definitely have darker effects on the city too. Oh my God, okay, and I have to speak to racism. Firstly, everything I'm telling you is such a surface level interpretation of a city I've been in for two months. Take this with a grain of salt and do some research. But secondly, all my perspectives on Berlin and Germany so far are through this lens of being a white person in Berlin and through conversations with different locals and trying to get a sense on racism as it stands in Berlin. I, I can't really extrapolate to Germany. There are still a lot of old conservative values which extend to microaggressions against brown and black foreigners here. These areas which do have a huge Turkish influence which so many Berliners get to benefit from because the food is amazing. They share their beautiful culture. They're like amazing people who just become part of the city. Do experience from some German Germans, like German lineage, white Germans, this uh, sentiment of, oh, foreigners coming in, taking over our city. And unlike places like the UK, Germany has taken in a lot more refugees. So there is still this anti-foreigner racism thing, which I've heard is still very present here in Germany, just more covert than in, say, the US. This is just from conversations, but I would love to learn more. Anything you have to say on this topic, let me know. Oh, and something else I'm really interested in is obviously following World War II and the horrific things that were done to Jewish people here. I'm really intrigued what modern day anti-Semitism looks like. And in conversation with young Germans, it seems the school system does a really good job here of 
emphasizing how awful the war and a lot of the German values in the war were. And I think it's like mandatory for school kids to visit, I don't know if it's Auschwitz, but definitely a concentration camp. But I've also heard that in older generations, there are still very anti-Semitic values. A lot of synagogues here don't state that they're a synagogue very openly. I've heard people actively hiding the fact they're Jewish. Also, I just realized I'm just rambling a lot. I don't know if this is actually interesting. <laughs> also, I'm so aware everything I'm saying, this is, this is not properly research backed. Please just realize this is my perspective and my attempt to learn. But at the same time, I think it's cool to discuss these topics to hopefully inspire you to seek out the issues in new places you go as well as seeing the beautiful tourist sites. Oh my god, let's talk bikes. If you followed me in my UK quarantine, you would know that bikes mean a lot to me. My bike got me through UK lockdown. I would go cycle for around an hour a day and it was my hour of the day. I would just cycle to beautiful green places and I loved it. This city is amazing because it's so built for cycling. There are bike lanes everywhere. And I remember the first few times I went on the big roads, like the massive wide roads with cars going next to you, but you're in your bike lane and like everyone's speeding along on their bikes. I was terrified. It took me a good few weeks of always going with people on those roads to get to the point where I feel very confident cycling in Berlin. I never thought I'd get here. <laughs> I'm from a small town in the UK. Like When I think of cycling, I think going to a field where I don't have to deal with traffic and cars and fear. But here, I understand how the road works. I get it. We're good now. Me and Berlin roads, we're friends. <laughs> Ish. People cycle so quickly here. The overtaking culture, I'm like, I thought I was going fast. Also, on that note, I have never felt this sense of independence that I feel in Berlin in the sense that if I want to go somewhere I don't wait for a bus, I don't wait for a train, I get on my bike and I can cycle for half an hour, 40 minutes and get almost anywhere. Like that is so special, this feeling of independence. And my thighs, wow. You can't get unfit in this city because if you're going to cycle, you're going to get fit. Your thighs are going to be like rocks. Okay, discussing workload quickly. The workload at Minerva, I know I say it all the time and I don't mean to just be like, feel like I'm trying to defend my uni and, and you know, make comments about other people's uni not being hard. No, I'm just complaining. It is hard. It is so, 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 so hard. <laughs> I have classes till midnight because of COVID and we're trying to accommodate time zones just this semester. And that is mentally draining. And I do, you know, six hours at least of reading, like genuine hard reading and notes and going over things a day. And then the classes. But the thing that's so hard is the assignments. And I get so many essays a week. Three essays in a week is a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. It's the first time I've looked at my uni, stared my uni down at the face and thinking, this is too much. Sometimes this is too much. And in general, I love my course. I feel like I have learned so much in the last two months, especially about the startup landscape and businesses and how the world functions and stocks and investing. All these things I'm like, oh, never thought I'd have a clue and now I'm starting to get a clue. And because I do cognitive neuroscience, I feel like I understand so much more about the way I'm viewing the world and how my brain works and uh, developmentally, how my perspectives on the world are being shaped and evolutionarily why I do things the way I do it. Like, fascinating, but so hard and so mentally draining. And I feel like I am watching my friends deteriorate throughout the term because the workload is just unfair. We get deadlines at the weekends. You've got a deadline at 7 a.m. So you're, you're pulling a bit of an all-nighter, sleeping, waking up at 5 a.m. to finish, only to get up the next day and repeat with your three classes, your six hours of reading, your SAG the next day. It's just, it's a lot. <laughs> Which is why I quickly want to speak to the beauty of small moments in life. Because truly, what gets me through the essays and the assignments and the, the the long nights of work is people and is this this habit of casual magic right where even if you're in lockdown 
what can you consciously find even when you are stressed to be grateful for and to try and be optimistic to try and be happy and just be like oh my god my roommate is letting you know they just cooked me a bit of dinner that's, that's so sweet i'm stressed thank you but like the way that the light comes in when it's sunny for once and just and just really taking a moment to appreciate that life is what you make of it and if you really focus on the good little things they make the hard times worth it i've also been doing this thing where when i meet up with people from my uni I will almost always make an effort to divert the conversation from schoolwork and from stress to some kind of depth that I think people need right now. My thought and invitation to you is, can you ask people questions that require them to tap back into what matters, their values, their perspective? I don't know if you guys feel it, but I think there is such heavy energy right now, or at least around me. It's getting darker, it's getting winter, you've got the US elections, you've got COVID and lockdown and loneliness and people struggling so much with mental health. You've got stress and you've got work and you're worrying about family and there is so much heaviness. And truly, I spent most of last week being in that heaviness and every single day, just feeling so down and so low for no tangible reason. It just feels like the world is, is just really not great. And that's hard. So how can you be cognizant of that? And when you meet with people, can you be that weird person who goes, tell me three things you're grateful for today. Tell me, I know it's a weird question, but just tell me anyway. You can laugh and be like, oh, that is, that is a bit out of context. But then it forces people to sit down and think, what's good? What's good right now? And surely there's something, something small. Ask people, what made your week? What is your favorite thing about yourself? What's your favorite thing about your culture? If you were your friend, what would you tell yourself to support yourself right now? What do you need to hear? Mental health is everything, guys. Health, physical health and mental health is everything stress hustle culture work we're all trained to believe that other stuff matters more than ourselves more than the health of our friends and family it's a lie that is a lie to make you make money i am less consistent on youtube not because i don't love you guys but because i love myself more and because with all the workload here when i have free time i've got to invest it back in this you know this thing up here takes constant work at least it does for me it takes constant good habits it takes prioritizing yourself and i invite you to do that even if it means saying no to people and being less of a people pleaser and to end off the most rambly weird little catch-up video i just really hope you're okay and if you're not okay that is okay this is a heavy time and i think even admitting to yourself that you feel the heaviness of now is so cool because in admitting it to yourself, you can think, okay, how can I evaluate what I'm doing with my life right now? And how can I change it a little bit to support myself more? <laughs> I'm, I'm recording a video. Yeah, yeah, I can see Have a good day. Yeah. Check in on someone, check in on yourself. Have a good tea. And that's all from me. Have a beautiful rest of your day. If you got to this point of the video, I don't even, it amazes me that people would watch this long of a video of me just rambling on my balcony. If you like this chatty form of video, please give it a thumbs up because already now that I've filmed this, I do this thing to myself, this perfectionistic stupid thing where I'm like, should I just not post this? <laughs> Was this just a ramble that I, I isn't actually useful? The number of videos I have filmed and never posted is insane because in the editing process, I just convinced myself that I don't need to share it or that it's not worth being watched or that it's not good enough so if you like it tell me have a beautiful rest of your day bye